Land of Israel today is known as uh, Yom HaShoah V'Hagvura. In fact, it's known that way around the world. Yom HaShoah V'Hagvura is the full name of the day. It's not only Holocaust Remembrance Day, but it's also Heroism Remembrance Day. We shouldn't forget that part of the title uh, that has been given to uh, today. In fact, today in Israel, I heard a report that uh, most entertainment venues are closed. Appropriately so, because we remember the terrible events that went on 70, 80 years ago. And here at Yorktown Jewish Center, it's certainly no exception. We remember that as well, but we also want to really focus on those stories which give inspiration to our people. And so that is always the focus of our Yom HaShoah V'Hagvura program. Tonight is no exception. You should have a booklet which outlines the program for this evening, highlighting notes and other interesting um, information. And in order to set the context for what we're going to do over the next hour or so together, I'm going to call upon our friend Bob Ashkenazi to set the, uh, set the history for us. So Bob, could you please come up? I have selected five months to concentrate my comments to give you context to what this evening is about. I have selected the months of June to October 1940. Following a disastrous military campaign in which German forces literally destroyed the French army. It was on June 15th, excuse me, June 16th, that the Prime Minister of France, Paul Reynard, handed his resignation to the Council of Ministers of France. On the following day, a divided Council of Ministers of the Third Republic selected a man who was a hero of World War I, whose efforts at Verdun gave him the title of Marshal. The gentleman I'm speaking of is Henri Philippe Pétain. Pétain decided that very day to seek an armistice with the Germans. And they delayed, principally because they thought they could get more territory during the interim period. And technically speaking, that delay gave to the Germans the opportunity to seize much more of northern France. The armistice was signed on July 22nd. And it has some very interesting provisions in it. First, as you look at the map, you will notice that northern and western France were occupied by the Germans. Central and southern France was occupied by French leadership. And in this particular case, it was Pétain who was in charge, head of state, eventually, who came to rule southern France. But that does not mean that southern France was independent of Germany, hardly, because all of the things that Pétain did were in accordance with that which what Germany wanted the French to do. So please don't make the assumption that just because this territory was unoccupied by the German military, 
It does not mean that the Germans were not, in fact, control, in control of this particular territory. They were, at least indirectly. So all of the policies that Peitan established at, in the city of Vichy were in accordance with what the Germans wanted. And I think that is an important point. In addition to the division of that territory, there were a, num a number of other provisions that I think are interesting to make mention of. First, the French were expected to pay all of the reparations, that is, all of the money to be occupied by the Germans. And that was to continue on a monthly basis until, really, 1944, or just before the end of World War II. Second, I think interestingly also, um, any non-French Jew, and there were at least 25,000 of them, were expected to be returned to Germany or to Austria, wherever they in fact came from. Thirdly, and very interesting as far as I'm concerned, is that the territory that the French controlled, either in North Africa or in Southeast Asia, were also to be demilitarized and so that the French could not stage, a, if you will, a recovery against the Germans or against, ultimately, the Japanese. So on July 13th, by a vote of 569 to 80, 569 to 80, the Chamber of Deputies, the French Parliament, voluntarily ended the Third Republic. Marshal Pétain was given, by that Chamber of Deputies, he was given full executive and legislative power. Just imagine that, full executive and legislative power. I think this is an important point, especially in the world that we live in today. While Pétain was not a fascist, or was not necessarily anti-Semitic, he was, in fact, a close friend of fascists and anti-Semites. And, anti and that remained for the entire period of time that, that Pétain was in power. Now, Pétain opposed continuing the war. And we might say, well, how come? Largely speaking, Pétain believed that continuing the war would ultimately lead to the destruction of Paris. And he felt that what the Germans had already done in Warsaw and in Amsterdam would be repeated in Paris. And therefore, he followed a policy of appeasement throughout his period of time and cooperation as much as he could with the Germans. Beginning in, beginning in July of 1940, he's in power, Pétain established a series of laws which contradicted the basic philosophy of France and the French Revolution. That is, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Those rights ceased to exist under Pétain. The ideals of liberty, fraternity, and equality no longer existed in France under Pétain. Among the laws that were passed by Pétain, I chose three just to make a very brief comment. The Vichy government under Pétain annulled legislation that had been passed in 1939 That, pr that punished those people who libeled or slandered anyone and anyone's religion, which was aimed particularly at French Jews. Second, a decree was established in which all properties belonging to Jews were ap appropriated by Pétain and the Vichy government. Finally, 25,000 non-French Jews were to be rounded up 
and then sent back to Germany. On October 20th, 1940, the final irony, Marshal Pétain meets, greets, and shakes hands with Adolf Hitler. One week later, on French radio, Pétain says, quote, we are, at the we are at the path to collaboration. And it's on those charges that Pétain was eventually tried and found guilty and ultimately was sent to jail rather than uh, the death penalty because of his age. But again, he collaborated with the Nazis. And that is the essence of the comments that I would like to make to you tonight. Thank you. Uh, as Bob mentioned, of course, Paris came under the control of the Nazis, and there was a song that was written, almost ironically, called The Last Time I Saw Paris. And it expresses the fact that Paris was, at one time, a beautiful place. Of course, by the time the song was written, it had already been, the character of the place had been changed by the Nazis. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. I heard the laughter of her heart, every street cafe. The last time I saw Paris, her trees were dressed for spring, and lovers walked beneath those trees, and birds found songs to I dodged the same old taxi cabs that I had dodged for years. The chorus of their squeaky horns was music to my ears. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. No matter how they change her, I remember that way. In the midst, I'm going to call upon Beatrice Bearer to come forward and share with her and share with us her experiences. Good evening. I'm here to introduce my mother. Beatrice Barrer, born Beatrice Ball in Paris, France. She's going to tell you the story of her childhood and her experiences during the Holocaust. I'm going to let her tell, that, tell you that story, but I would like to tell you a little bit more about her and what she has accomplished after those trying times. My mother grew up in Paris with her parents, her sister, and a governess. She danced ballet, played the piano, and sang opera. She became a Parisian model, and when she moved to the United States when she was 18, she modeled for Christian Dior. Don't laugh when you look at me, okay? <laughs> she married and had two very good-looking boys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> While being a mother of two young children in a foreign country and in her second or third language, she got her undergraduate degree when she attended Queens College after that, she went on to get her master's at Adelphi University and had a long career as a psychotherapist at Long Island Jewish Hospital, as well as developing her own private practice. About a year and a half ago, we celebrated my mother's 80th birthday as a family here in Yorktown. It was a memorable weekend. Surrounded by her children and grandchildren, my mother read us her memoirs that she had been preparing for many months. She felt very strongly about sharing her story with her grandchildren and has been eager to share her story tonight. We all know that many Holocaust survivors refused or had a difficult time sharing those memories with others. We are honored tonight to have my mother share those memories with us. I present to you Beatrice Barrett. Thank you, darling. This is to my children, Andrew, Debbie, Kenneth, Aaron, and my grandchildren, Logan, Milo, Eli, Solomon, 
Deva and Jesse. I was born in Paris on January 11th, 1938. My father, Clemens, was born in Galicia, Poland. My mother, Fanny, was born in Russia, and her family moved to Hanover, Germany, when she was a year old. My father was raised in Vienna. He was very athletic. He played field hockey, soccer, and even fenced for his school. He also played the violin. He moved to Berlin as a young man when he opened a store for women's clothing. My mother studied the piano. In her teens, she accompanied silent movies. She was very talented and would have probably pursued a professional career. They both came individually from Germany to Paris due to the rise of anti-Semitism. In Germany at that time, Jews were moving away from close adherence to the traditions of their faith. Starting in the late 18th century, the German Jewish Enlightenment marked the political, social, and intellectual transition of European Jews to modernity. This was illustrated on my mother's side by the fact that her grandmother wore a shadow, whereas her parents were no longer religious and became involved in the growing socialist movement. Perhaps this background, combined with the Holocaust, led my parents to a complete movement away from the outward trappings of religion and towards a strong commitment to Zionism. My parents were involved in raising money for Israel. In recognition of their effort, they were invited along with many others to the home of the Baron de Rothschild, a major Zionist benefactor. This is the atmosphere in which I grew up with a strong identification as a Jew and no formal adherence to rituals. My parents met and married in Paris on September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, then Norway, Denmark, France, and Belgium, one after the other. On June 3rd, 1942, the Germans bombarded Paris. Gas masks were distributed, but when my parents found out that they were known for their four-year-old, they decided that if a, a um, chemical attack would start, they would get into bed and put me in the middle without wearing gas masks. They were ready to die if I could not survive. I'm not sure when my parents made the decision to leave Paris. We were no longer there, however, when on July 16, 1942, to the shame of France, the French police arrested 13,152 Jews including 4,000 children, and put them in a sports stadium called the Veldiv. They remained there for days in the blazing heat without sanitation, water, or food before being deported to the extermination camp of Auschwitz. By this time, however, we were probably in a villa in Saint Raphael, a town on the French Riviera. The south of France was part of Free France, from 1940 to 1942. Vichy was its capital. The Germans occupied northern and western France. This partition took place when France capitulated and signed an armistice with Nazi Germany in June of 1940. Okay. I have few memories about what happened to me during the war. That is between the age of four and seven. It is as, I'm sorry. It is as if a heavy curtain was drawn over these years, opening only on traumatic events, then closing again. I'm four years old. My father and I are standing in front of the entrance to my parents' bedroom. I see my mother lying on the bed. She's screaming in anguish. I ask my father why, and he tells me that she has a bad headache. Years later, as an adult, my therapist asked me about my first memory. I burst into tears and described that repressed memory. 
Later, I found out what happened. The Gestapo had come into our house in San Rafael and arrested my grandparents and my aunt. They were never seen again. At the time, my mother was hiding alone upstairs while my father had taken me out for a stroll. She had heard the Gestapo downstairs, but had been powerless to stop them. My mind cannot even begin to imagine what my mother experienced during and after this traumatic event. Had my father and I not been out for a stroll, my mother would have lost her husband and her child as well. Following the deportation of my mother's family, the decision was made to leave France and attempt to get asylum in Switzerland. Armed with false papers, we arrived by bus at the Swiss border. My parents were interrogated by the French Border Patrol as to who they were and their purpose for the trip. I was told that my father got nervous and that the French Border Patrol became suspicious and we were arrested. The curtain opens again on my second memory. We are in a prison cell filled with people. It's a small cell. The atmosphere is of one of danger and fear. I'm sure that as a small child, I could not possibly understand what was going on, but the sense of danger was absorbed by every fiber of my body. One of the pitfalls of childhood is that one does not have to understand something to feel it. By the time the mind is able to understand what happened, the wounds are already too deep. We are being transported to a concentration camp in France run by the French called Gurs. Gurs was not an extermination camp, but a point of deportation to the death camps. In July 1942, the French Fiji government turned over 505,000 Jews from Gurs to the Nazis. They were sent to Drancy, a Vichy-run concentration camp near Paris, and from there to Auschwitz. I have no memory of Gurs, but I have read that the conditions there were terrible, food was scarce and there was no sanitation, it rained a lot and the drainage was poor so the soil was always muddy. Later, my mother told me that I was covered with scabs and that I had lice in my hair. I slept on straw. Here, I want to talk about my mother and how strong she remained under these inhuman conditions. She told me that what you were given to eat was a thin soup and a piece of stale bread. Sometimes there were worms in the soup. She told me that while some prisoners would hardly bring themselves to eat what they were given, she would always ask and hope for seconds. The curtain opens again. Oh, I'm sorry. My mother also volunteered to take care of prisoners who got ill, hoping that this might gain her some privileges. She described to me how between patients she would dip her arms up to the elbow in a strong disinfection solution. She never got ill. <clears throat> the curtain opens on the third memory. My parents are behind barbed wires and they are watching me walk away from the camp with a friend of my mother from Paris named Elga. <clears throat> I can remember the look of anguish on my parents' face. I don't remember crying or understanding what was really happening. Now when I think that my parents were saying goodbye to their child, not knowing if they would ever see her again, the thought is unbearable. Due to the fact that my mother took care of prisoners who were sick, she was able to make some trips to the nearby village to pick up medications at the pharmacy. She wrote to her friend Elga, who was not Jewish, and asked her if she would be willing to meet her at the village pharmacy and tried to get me out of the camp. How this was accomplished, I do not know. It was decided that Elga would take me back to Saint Raphael, to the house we had lived in, now occupied by Gentiles. Apparently, after a while, my father got a letter from the mayor 
with whom he had become friendly, telling him that he had heard rumors that I was being mistreated. My father was able to get a pass to come and get me, and he took me to another Gentile couple who lived further out in the, in the countryside. There was a reason why my parents were spared further deportation. It was decreed that the families of French Jews who had volunteered to serve in, in the French army would not be deported. My father had volunteered at the beginning of the war, but had soon been discharged when France fell to the Nazis and the French army was dissolved. As to his ability to obtain passes which allowed him to move me around and even visit me, it was probably due to his access to money. The description of such a visit breaks my heart. My father walked miles in the snow to visit me, and I turned away from him. As a child who did not understand why, I felt that he had abandoned me. One day I was outside, and I heard the echo of my mother's voice calling my name. She had been released from the camp and had come to get me. I do have the memory of seeing her walking along a path, carrying a large suitcase. That memory stayed alive. When I returned to school in the US to graduate from college, I wrote a piece about this event, which was re read by the professor to the class. The lack of memory and numbness are common to most children of survivors who were separated at an early age from their parents and hidden by strangers. This is powerfully described in a book entitled, quote, The Hidden Children by Jane Marks. My father was the warmth in my life. I forget something. <laughs> For many years into my adult life, there were times when I was unable to feel completely connected emotionally to certain events. When my father died suddenly at the age of 56, I was unable to grieve. My father was the warmth of my life. He was very affectionate and told me often how much he loved me. In contrast, I experienced my mother as cold and distant. I think and I know that before the war, before she lost her family, I must have had a different kind of mother. To, today, this makes sense to me, but as a child, it caused me a lot of pain. In therapy, I once said that if I were to start talking about my mother, I would never stop crying. I cried for a long time. I know my mother loved me, but not in the way I needed given my early history. To this day, if I close my eyes, I can conjure up my mother's face from the time of the war. I, a young, unsmiling face. I miss her terribly now. At this time, there are so many questions I would like to ask her, the answers of which I will never know. As was the case for so many children survivors, asking questions about what happened to their family during the Holocaust was met with little information. You wanted to know, but you knew that asking questions would, be, would reawaken painful memories. As a result, you were left with a feeling of anxiety and the need to protect the very parents whose responsibility it was to protect you, a heavy burden for any child. How strange to look at photographs of my maternal grandmother and my Aunt Rachel holding me. There is so much love and delight on their faces. I cannot remember what it was like to have them in my life. Being a grandmother now, I can appreciate the immensity of the loss. The loss was great on my father's side. From what I understand, his family did not leave Germany in time. My father's parents, along with one of his sisters, were shot by the Nazis. Another sister, Lola, survived, married, and had a son, George. After the war, my father gave them money so that they could move to Australia. They became multimillionaires, manufacturing the uniform for the Australian Army and the police force. Eventually, my father was released from the concentration camp of Gurs and sent to a labor camp in, France, in the French countryside, where he worked as a forced labor chopping wood. 
Someone took pictures of him, and you can see how emaciated and depressed he looked. That is when we moved into a farmhouse near the labor camp that was, um, that was owned by an elderly woman. The family was together again. While my father worked in the labor, labor camp, we lived in that farmhouse in Corrèze, in southeast, southwest France. It's from then on that I began to retain memories. Due to the fact that the area of Corrèze where we were hiding was heavily wooded, the French resistance called in rural, rural, rural areas, the Maquis, was very active there. The French resistance consisted of a collection of small cells that fought the Nazis and French collaborators with guerrilla warfare during the occupation. Behind our farmhouse, there was a dense forest. Sometimes at night, I saw my father run in, in to join the Maquisar. The story I was told perhaps happened then. One night, my father was confronted by German soldiers who asked him where the other Maquisar were hiding. When he refused to tell them, he was told to dig his grave. When he still refused to give up the information, one of the German soldiers told him, you're a brave man. They let him go. The Germans were losing the war by then, which seemed to have intensified the atrocities they committed. A German division swept the region in April 1944. It committed many massacres of civilians in cities and towns. Anyone interested can Google Oradour. It's called Oradour-sur-Glane, is the name of a city. I went there on one of my trips back to France. It was a horrifying experience. Actually, they left everything the way the German had, you know, really s what they had done to, the, to that uh, village. It took many years for the French people to acknowledge their shameful role in the persecution of the Jews. President Chirac, on July 18th, 1995, an anniversary of the Veldiv Roundup, stated that 4,500 French policemen, under the authority of their leaders, obeyed the commands of the Nazis. Newly elected President Macron, at the last anniversary of the Roundup in July 2017, stated, and I quote, it was indeed France that organized the Roundup. Not a single German took part. I say it here again. It was France that organized the roundup, the deportation, and thus for almost all, death. I have, written, I have written these pages for my children and grandchildren so that they can learn about a part of their family history with which they may not be completely familiar. And because anti-Semitism is a disease that has no cure, there are many deniers that the Holocaust ever took place. We must remain vigilant, even here in America. For example, Charlottesville, a couple of, a few months ago. My whole family that I so love exists today because we survived against all odds, often due to pure luck, never again. In 1930, Monique Cerf spent much of the war fleeing with her family around France, one step ahead of the Nazis and their French collaborators who were hunting Jews to deport them to the death camps. Surviving the war, young Monique became a singer-songwriter, becoming famous as the performer Barbara. To sing one of Barbara's songs about a black eagle, which may represent the Third Reich emblem, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Stern. Stephanie Stern will also be speaking later tonight about her own French family's experiences during the Shoah. Thank you. 
During uh, May and June 1942, Paris was visited by three senior Nazi officials, Reinhard Heydrich, Himmler's young SS protege, the man who convened and managed the Wannsee Conference in January, which proposed and decided on the details of the final solution, Adolf Eichmann, who hosted the conference under Heydrich's watchful eye and who was tasked with operationalizing the final solution, and Fritz Saukel, who controlled the forced labor effort in support of the German arms industry. Unsatisfied by the French administration's failure to swiftly uh, move against the Jewish question, they replaced the French planners with Germans who were certain to be more responsive and efficient. Before dawn on July 16th, under German orders, 9,000 French policemen began rounding up foreign Jews who had made their way to Paris, escaping there from around Europe. Buses were deployed and waiting with their drivers. On that day, more than 11,000 Jews were arrested and detained in the Winter Stadium, the velodrome known as Veldiv, built for international bicycle racing. The Nazi planners called this action Operation Spring Breeze. Within the week, the crowd had swollen to more than 13,000 Jews, 4,000 of whom were children between the ages of 2 and 16. These Jews had come to France seeking asylum from Germany, Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Russia. While many of the men had gone into hiding, forewarned by elements of the French resistance of the possibility of deportation to the East, the women and children assumed they were safe and didn't hide. The conditions in the stadium were horrendous. The only water came from a single hydrant that pumped filthy water from the Seine. Thin soup provided by the Red Cross was ladled into cupped hands. And five toilets were immediately overwhelmed by the crowd with unimaginable results. Diphtheria, measles, scarlet fever broke out immediately for which there was no medicine available. And without ventilation, this is July, in, uh, or, or yeah, July in Paris, um, uh, the stench and the heat were unbearable. In the ensuing weeks, Jews were moved to camps around France, and as the first step in their deportation, camps run entirely by the French. In late July, parents were separated from their children and deported to Auschwitz, with around 1,000 being moved every couple of days. 3,000 babies and young children were left behind in the French camps until September when they were deported alone in sealed railway cars to Auschwitz. Many died of exposure en route, 
the survivors were immediately gassed upon arrival. By the end of September 42, nearly 38,000 Jews from around France had been shipped to Auschwitz by 45 these, of these Jews, less than 1,000 remained alive. The French police had conducted the arrest, not the Nazis. They had run the French camps, not the Nazis. The French, by and large, either actively collaborated with their German overlords or were indifferent to the persecution. The anti-Semitic strains running through French history reignited once again. A small minority of French, however, did look the other way as some Jews escaped, while an even smaller subset actively resisted the Germans by assisting the escapees and hiding Jews slated for de deportation, as we've heard in Beatrice Barra's narrative. After the war, France acknowledged the roundup, but never owned up to the fact that it was entirely conducted by French authorities, not until 1995 when President Jacques Chirac finally spoke to the nation of French responsibility for the barbarous act, saying, quote, these black hours will stay in our history forever. They are a front to our past and traditions. The criminal insanity of the occupiers was assisted by the French and by the French state. On the 75th anniversary of the Valdiv Roundup, President Emmanuel Macron led an international conv convocation of remembrance. He opened with a tribute to uh, President Chirac, whose guiding thread removed the mask and exposed the truth, and to his successors, de Villepin, Sarkozy, and Hollande. And Macron denounced all efforts today within France to obfuscate and cover up French respo responsibility. He was unequivocal in stating, quote, I condemn all the tricks and subtleties of those who claim that today that Vichy was not France and did not represent the French people. The crimes of July 16th and 17th, 1942, were the work of the French police obeying orders from the government of Pierre Laval, the general commissioner for Jewish affairs. Not a single German took part. Uh, first of all, I want to offer thanks to my Aunt, Aunt Lucy for putting down her memories. Um, uh, my mother uh, didn't speak about her experiences during the war very much at all. She was, as you described, as Beatrice talked about. Um, my mother, Francine, had four sisters, Lucy, Hélène, Sabine, and Ida. In 1926, my grandparents moved the family from Poland to Paris, where they were all living in June 1940, when Paris was occupied by Germany. In my Aunt Lucy's memoir, she writes that in 1941, her husband, Charles, was mobilized by the Germans to work in a foundry as a metals expert. They hoped that this status would protect them and their three young children. But on August 20th, Charles was arrested. 10,000 people were taken as hostage, hostages that day and held for weeks at the internment camp at Trancy. In the last letter Lucy received from him, Charles wrote that he was sick and had lost 50 pounds. He implored her to send him a family picture. She had no way of knowing if it ever reached him. People came from afar to watch the departure of the Jews from Trancy. Lucy writes, the waiting was excruciating. Finally, we saw them come out. They dragged their feet slowly, hopelessly, lifeless, emaciated figures. It was too far to distinguish their faces. Some of the crowd said, it's not right, it's a crime. Even Jews, they are human beings. Some weeks later, she learned he had been sent to the East and he never came back. On July 16, 1942, the news spread that all foreign-born Jews who were still free, including women and children, would be sent to the camps. Single young women would be taken first. My mother Francine and her sister Hélène, as well as my grandfather, who we called Grandpère, we would refer to him as Grandpère, had already left Paris. Lucy sent a message to the house of my grand-mère, warning her two unmarried sisters, Sabine and Ida, to spend the night with her at a Gentile friend's home. Unfortunately, no one believed the warning. The following morning, Grandmère came to Lucy in tears and told her that Sabine and Ida had been arrested. They were never to see them again. And there was more bad news. 
Women who had children were now being arrested, so Lucy had to leave immediately. She knew she had to leave Paris, and the only way was to find a passeur who would smuggle her and her youngest daughter into the free zone, otherwise known as Vichy France, the free zone. Lucy's son had already been hidden in a Catholic boys' school. Grandmère and the older daughter would follow as soon as they could. After one failed attempt at escape, Lucy managed to find a second passeur. The little group took the train to Tours and then had to trudge in silence all night through thick forest and muddy fields until they arrived in Vichy. But their problems weren't over. Attempting to continue their journey by train, they were apprehended by the police. Lucy was told that if they couldn't find lodging, they would be forced to leave the area, but nobody would rent to Jews. Even in Vichy, France, Jews were being deported by the police. Lucy searched desperately for lodging. By great good luck, she managed to find a modest little house. They were joined by Grandmère and Lucy's older daughter, who had made their escape from Paris in the coal car of a freight train, their heads covered with rags and their bodies immersed in water. During this time, Grandpère traveled around the countryside looking for an apartment for the family. Friends recommended the summer resort of Le Chambon sur Lignon, where he was able to rent a two-bedroom apartment. And you'll hear more about this village in a couple of minutes. Uh, returning to his lodging in Lyon, Grandpère was immediately arrested and interned in a camp near Limoges. My mother Francine, who had been living with him in Lyon, went to the camp. Being blonde and blue-eyed, she could easily pass as a Gentile, and it was not difficult for her to get permission to visit him, but she was unable to gain his freedom. It was up to Aunt Lucy to make the excruciating decision to risk sending her 10-year-old daughter, Irene, to plead for his freedom. The young girl went alone on the three-day journey, and miraculously, she succeeded. This dear cousin of mine, who passed away just a couple of years ago, had plenty of chutzpah to spare. <laughs> and yes, I knew her very well. <laughs> now they heard that the Germans would soon occupy all of France. Lucy contacted the, the, the OSE, an organization formed to protect French Jewish children, and they offered to hide her daughters. She had to promise not to write them, and their names would be changed. As soon as she could, Lucy herself moved to Grenoble in the French Alps to join my mother Francine, who had recently found work there. My mother, with her Aryan looks, had no problem assuming the identity of the Protestant girl from her false ID card. Lucy also obtained such a card, but they lived in constant fear of discovery. A week after Grandpère was released, he moved to Le Chambon, where Grandmère joined him. They were hoping for a more peaceful life, but she fell ill and the doctor was called. He diagnosed liver cancer. Being Jewish, she could not be brought to the hospital in Lyon. My mother and Lucy came to be with her, and she passed away on May 9, 1943. I'm named after Grandmère Stefania. At the funeral, the villagers came to participate in their sorrow. The pastor offered words of consolation, and the mayor gave them space for the coffin in his family grave. After the war, Lucy was moved to Paris. Uh, Lucy had had the remains moved to Paris, and she and and Stefania was given a Jewish burial. Finally, time was on their side. Soon after the Allied landing in Normandy in June 1944, Lucy was able to make her way back to Paris. Once there, she began walking toward her destination along with many other refugees who had returned to Paris. A woman spoke to her and said, all this is the fault of the Jews. They sold our France to Hitler. They deserve what happened to them. You will see what we will do to them if they should come back. In shock, Lucy did not answer her, but these words influenced her decision to leave France. And Lucy wrote, I did not want to bring up my children where the symbolic words of this land, liberté, égalité, fraternité, had lost their meaning. 
Soon after Lucy was reunited with her children, they emigrated to Palestine. My mother had met my dad, an American soldier. They were married in 1946 in Paris, and he brought her to the US. In the 1950s and the 60s, my parents sponsored Lucy and her family to come here, and they would live with us for a year or so, and then move out on their own, and then the next round would come. Um, as well as their sister, Ellen, who had escaped to Brazil, as well as Ellen's son, born in Brazil. A few months ago, I was at Yad Vashem, and I was able to see the names of my aunts, Sabine and Ida, and think about these women who I never knew. And that is Lucy's story. And thank you for listening. From December 1940 to September 1944, the inhabitants of the French village of Le Chambon sur Lignon and the surrounding villages provided refuge to some 5,000 people. This number included 3,000 to 3,500 Jews fleeing from the Vichy authorities and the Germans. Led by Protestant pastor, pastor André Trocmé, his wife Magda, and his assistant, the people offered shelter in private homes, hotels, on farms and in schools, as well as forging identification and ration cards. In some cases, they arranged for safe passage to Switzerland. Their own history as a persecu persecuted religious minority led them to identify with the persecuted. The organized ref rescue effort began in the winter of 1940 when Pastor Trocme made contact with the Quaker organization in Marseille. The Quakers were able to negotiate the release of many Jews, especially children, from internment camps in southern France, and the villagers took them in. Next photo. Word spread, and Jews and others in danger also found their way to the region. The refugees were mostly foreign-born Jews who did not hold French citizenship. A majority were children. In order to conceal their true identity, the children often attended Protestant religious services, but Trocme encouraged them to hold their own Jewish services. The unity of the local population compelled the Vichy authorities to tread lightly. But after the Germans occupied southern France, their attitude changed. In February 1943, French police arrest, arrested Trocme and his assistant and interned them in a local camp. Released after 28 days, they continued their rescue work until late in 1943, when rumors of re-arrest sent them into hiding themselves. Magda Trocme took over the rescue operation. In June 1943, the German police raided a local secondary school and arrested 18 students. Five were identified as Jews and sent to Auschwitz, where they perished. The Germans also arrested their teacher, Daniel Trocme, Pastor Trocme's cousin, and deported him to the Maidanek co concentration camp, where he was killed. Roger Le Forestier, Le Chambon's doctor, who had helped Stephanie's grandmother, and who was active in helping Jews with false documents, was arrested and shot in August 1944. The region was liberated the following month. The State of Israel has recognized all the inhabitants of the region, as well as 40 named individuals from Le Chambon, as righteous among the nations. Today, the Chambonais operate a center for those seeking political asylum the International Secondary School, founded by Pastor Trocme in 1938, and a major part of the rescue e effort during the Shoah, remains open. The Chambon Foundation, dedicated to communicating lessons of hope intertwined with the Holocaust's unavoidable lessons of despair, was started in 1982 by a Jewish filmmaker born in the village during the war. As a resident explains, France is not a very welcoming country. People need to understand that if we don't want genocide to happen again, we have to know about the story. 
from 1942 to 1944, more than 70,000 French Jews were deported to death camps. 11,400 were children. In Paris alone, 6,000 children were deported. Several years ago, I was in Paris. And every day, I passed a school with a slate plaque attached to it, to the school facade. It read, oh, I'll try it in French, but you'll pardon my French. <laughs> A la mémoire des petits enfants de cette école maternelle. To the memory of small children of this school deported because they were born Jews. They were victim, innocent victims of the barbaric Nazis with the complicity, the active complicity of the government of Vichy. This project of plaques on schools it's called A La Memoire, to the memory. And more, more of these plaques are appearing all the time. <laughs>
Exalted, compassionate God, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence. Among the holy and the pure, to the souls of all of our brethren, men, women, and children of the house of Israel, who were slaughtered and burned, may their memory endure, inspiring truth and loyalty in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace, let us say, El Mole Rahamim, Shochene Bamromim, Am Zemen Uchane Chonam, Tachat Kanefe Ashkinam, Memalot Kedoshim Utiorim. Kizohar Arakiyam Mazihirim et nishemot Kol achenu b'nei Yisrael Anashim enashim v'tav Shene b'regu Feshenit b'chu Veshenisrefu Veshenechneku Began heden Tehye menuchatam Ano baal ar-rachamim Astirem b'seter knafechom Le'olamim Utsero bore b'tsero rachamim Et nishmoteem Adonai Amin, we believe. Which you'll find on page 18, page 18. Please join me. Anim, amin, anim, amin, anim, amin, amin. which the choir sings, ultimately, redemption will come to the Jewish people and the whole world. Ah, yes, yes, yes, that's right. Thank you. Rabba, v'yama divrach rutei, v'yam lich malchutei, v'chai echon, v'yom echon, v'chai echol beit Yisrael, v'agala v'izman karim, v'imru amein. Yehe Shmei Rabba Mevorach Leolam Ulolmei Almayach. Yitbarach, Yishtabach, Yitbar, Yitromam, Yitnasei, Yitadar, Yitalev, Yitalal, 
geçmedi bu şa uyku. Leyla mikol bir hata, şirata, kuş bir hata, nehmata, yamiran bir alma, yürü, amel. Yehey şlama raba min şmaya, ve hayim aleyn, yal kol İsrail, yürü, amel. Say shalom, Ibro Mark. Hallelujah. Say shalom. Hallelujah. Holy Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. May be seated. Attention for a moment to uh, our friend Ken Bearer. Just a short, quick word. Just want to acknowledge someone else who is, is here tonight. My cousin Karen and her husband Rich. Um, Karen's grandfather and my mother's and my grandmother, my mother's mother, were first cousins, and um, she too experienced the Holocaust in, in much the same way as many others. And she wrote a book. Um, called Don't, Don't They Know the World Stop Breathing. And I just want to acknowledge and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I will leave this on the back table if anybody is interested in taking a look, but it's another part of our family story in regards to the Holocaust. So thank you for coming, Karen. <coughs> All of us heard what uh, occurred at the Chabad in California just three days ago. There are 
Nazis alive and well who wish to exterminate the Jewish people, wherever they may be. And Rabbi Goldstein, the rabbi of that synagogue, adjured Jews around the world to stand up and be Jews and do Jewish and increase our practices and loyalty to Judaism, and we have that opportunity right now. We're in the midst of doing a very beautiful commandment from the Torah, and that is to count the Omer. The days between Passover and Shavuot, and so perhaps a very fitting way to show the world that we're not afraid, that we continue to do our Jewish practices for us to engage in more mitzvot. Please turn with me in the Sidurim, the prayer books, the blue prayer books that you have in front of you. Turn to page, um, turn to page 55. Last night's count in the Omer was uh, 11. And so why don't we rise and join together in the mitzvah of counting the Omer on page 55. Our custom is to read that English paragraph right before the blessing itself beginning with the words, I am ready. And do remember that last night's count was uh, 11. And so we'll know what to count for tonight. <laughs> I'm ready to fulfill the mitzvah of counting the omen. As it is ordained in the Torah, you shall count from the eve of the second day of Pesach, when an omer of grain is to be brought as an offering, seven complete weeks. The day after the seventh week of your counting will make 50 days. Baruch Atap Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haulam Asher Kitshanu Bemitzvotav Vetzivanu Al Sefirat Haomer Hayom Shneim Asar Yom Sheheim Shavua Echad Bachamisha Yamim Laomer Tonight begins the twelfth day, which constitutes a week and five days into the counting of the Omer. Please be seated for a final word from our friend Mike Busson. The final word is thanks very much for coming. Um, uh, it's been wonderful getting together for this occasion. And please, on your way out, if you haven't lit, lit a candle, please light a candle on the back and take a look if you didn't get a chance coming in at the exhibit. Thanks very much. Sure.